All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so today we have a couple of topics to cover. So one is going to be the exercise of the split plot RCBD. So we finished the lecture last class. We talked about different sizes of experimental units, um, how they are creating different error terms, and how we have to check to make sure that we are running the proper model and having those different error terms coming through. So we're gonna go through that exercise today. And then I anticipate we'll probably be able to get through the lecture of the repeated measures. So that was a topic that I spent, I try to, I try to spend a good amount of time to make sure that I could pass to you the, the concept, but not making it more complicated than needed. And I guess we'll see how, how good of a job I did in my lecture to do that. I do anticipate you're still going to have, it's not, you know, once we go through the lecture, you're still probably not going to have, have a clear cut understanding of that is until we do the exercise, because that's really the hands on side that is going to give you the a better understanding of what, what we're doing with repeated measures and how that is helping us to, mo to model lack of independence. Anyways, I think that we're going to be able to get through the lecture today and then Next Tuesday, we'll go through the repeated measure exercise. Um, and also, I, at the end of today, I want to talk to you about the uh, the project. So we have a midterm project that I will share with you some more information. But really, just to get you thinking about this, my goal is that now that you learn some of these analysis, and of course, these are not all the analysis that exist, there's many more that we could go through. It could be you know, multiple semesters of statistical classes to cover a lot of them. We just covered the most popular ones. So the project's just gonna be about asking you to take data that you have already collected for your study, if that's the case, and apply these concepts, apply these workflows, even though it may be a little bit more complicated, maybe a little bit simpler, whatever is the case, um, my goal is that you apply what you learn to your own data so you get a direct benefit from what you learn in this class. And if you do require extra resources to go through your data that we did not cover in class, I'll be glad to share that with those people that do need more resources. Um, and then, of course, I'm not going to have a lecture on it, but you're going to have resources that you can read and try and try to implement uh, for your specific cases. If you, um, maybe just here in Athens, if I can just have a show of hands to understand who does not have your own data collected yet, that you would not, you would need maybe another data set from somebody else. Okay, so we have maybe six people here, it seems like. So ideally for this portion would be like experimental design type of data. So something, you don't have it. Well, I mean, the response variable really doesn't matter, right? It does, it does not have to be yield. As long as you're collecting sensor data on a experimental design study, that, 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 that's what we're looking for. So like, if you, is that your case? Like, do you have actual studies that you have treatments and the design that you're collecting data from? I have the uh, data, like, so for example, the last my project, I have ice data for the day So I have that kind of data, I'm not. Mm -hmm. So it'd be more like observational data. You, you don't have any treatments applied that were not randomized. Okay. So I'll, I'll send a poll um, for us, to, for me to understand better what everyone's situation is, if, what type of data you have, if that is experimental design type of data that would, you could apply here. But really, I guess if you have observational data, that would be more of a machine learning approach than an experimental design approach. But I do still want you all to go through like some data that relates more closely to you but when it comes to experimental design on these projects. I could, you know, I could provide you data that I either find online or or some of my previous data sets, but my main goal is that that data is relatable to your area and that you can really you know, go through, especially if it is your own data. Anyways, I guess that that's just, um, just something to, for us to think about. If you 
if you do have that type of data, experimental design data on any response variable, it does not have to be yield. It could be remote sensing data. It could be plant, soil, whatever you're measuring. As long as it has a treatment and experimental design behind it, that's what we're looking for. So if you have that type of data, that'd be great. If you don't, then through the survey, I'll share with you all. You can let me know what you have, or even if you have no data at all yet, because it just started, that's also okay. Uh, you know, we may just have to work a little bit better to find the data set that's going to be more relatable to you. Okay, so I guess, so today, the split plot, uh, coding exercise, repeated measures lecture, and then we'll talk maybe a little bit more about the project at the end. And then next week, we'll do the repeated measure coding exercise and then start moving a little bit away from repeated measure or, no, sorry, not repeated measures, moving a little bit away from experimental design data and start getting to some areas that are perhaps in between experimental design and machine learning. So talking about regression, a few important types of regressions, and then from that point on, really get more into the machine learning side of things. All right, so um, for us to get started with today's class, uh, I do wanna ask you to launch your 06, or I'm sorry, the 05 SPP exercise. So that's the one that we set up last class. So you should have this project. You should have two partial codes, the one one for the randomization that I believe we we finished the randomization, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have the randomization and also the mixed partial. So today we're going to be working with that. And also, if you have not done yet, because I don't think we need it for the randomization exercise, uh, we need to have that we NK bulk CSV in the data folder of this project here, 05 SPP. If you don't have that yet, you can get this either from the previous projects. So the 04 RCBD or CR, 03 CRD have that, that, um, that object there. And, um, and you can just copy and paste that here. So if you go ahead and launch that project, um, we're going to make sure that you come on your files tab, go on your code folder, and launch this specific script, which is the SPP mixed partial. All right. Um, so today our goals are gonna be to create this analytical workflow as we have been doing already on previous exercises where we bring in data, we wrangle it, we model, check assumptions, check an over table, decide what means we have to extract and what pairwise comparisons to make. Um, and in this case here is gonna be with a split plot RCBD with random blocks, right? And I think Benita had this question uh, about, okay, so, well, we only have four blocks and we just said that if we have less than five, eight or 10 levels, I guess different different sources have different thresholds there, but let's say if we have less than, than eight uh, levels of that vector, uh, you know, the, the variance estimates are gonna be less precise than if we were actually treating blocks as fixed and getting means instead of variances. That is still true here. The only, the only perhaps difference that we will sacrifice in, in in favor of is that by having random blocks, uh, we can properly specify the error structure of these split plots. So we're gonna be able to say through the random effects of blocks and what comes with it that you're gonna be seeing, seeing next. That's how we, we properly identify the error structure of this model. So we have to, we kind of have to treat that as random here, just so we, we make sure that we have the proper degrees of freedom of the error testing the proper effects, as we talked about in the previous class when we went through the ANOVA of the split plot. All right, so if you want to come down here and just run this the, the setup chunk, uh, it just has all the packages that we're going to need. You should have all of them. Um, if you don't, you know how to take care of that. You just need to install that packages for that package. And again, I know I'm being repetitive, but I think it's never it's never um, too much to mention. We are using the same data set to run different designs on it, 
for teaching purposes. So we can really connect, so we can think of this initial design and see how we could have progressively become more complex if needed. However, on your side, your design is set up, right? You don't have the choice of playing around with the design of your study. Your design, your code that, we, that you analyze this data should represent the design that was implemented on the field, which is not something you can play with anymore because it probably already happened, right? <clears throat> In this case, it has already happened because we already have the data. And so in your case, I do not recommend you play around with, with your model uh, when it comes to experimental design type of analysis. So if you wanna go ahead and uh, just, I left you, I think I left you most of the code of this script because again, a lot of the things are the same. There are gonna be a few differences and those are the ones that we're gonna be coding together in class. but. A lot of the previous steps here, we, we already done with the previous CRD and RCBD exercises. So just go ahead and run this chunk here. So we get, we read in our data. Um, actually, let me, let me, let me ask you this. Do you, because now I'm, I'm just thinking if, um, so when you read this in, do you have block or do you have rep? Yeah. Rep, okay. So maybe let's just, uh, I think maybe I, I did this in a wrangling step that I did not include here. So in your case, let's just do a very quick wrangling. Let's see. Well, we can actually leave to do that when we get to the wrangling uh, chunk. So for now, let's, it's okay for you to have wrap and I have block, but that should be the only difference. Everything else should be the same. So 36 number of rows, five columns, we have treatment block, uh, nitrogen rate, potassium rate, and yield. You know, just is the same data, so we're not going to learn anything new here. But I have this here, so in case you copy this script in the future to adapt to your own analysis, you always have this EDA. So EDA, exploratory data analysis. Initially, we're just doing that with tables, getting a summary of the variables. We already went through this. Um, also doing a glimpse. That helps us to understand the, how R is interpreting these variable types here. As we talked about already for the for the RCBD example, so before we were doing split plots, but it still were, was an RCBD, we have to transform, in your case, you have wrap. We're going to address that shortly. We have to transform wrap or block nitrogen rate and potassium rate to factors. Because again, this is an analysis of variance. And with that, we work with treatment factors that for the most part are categorical variables, right? So even though N rate, potassium rate are numerical and those numbers may actually have a meaning, but for our purpose in analysis of variance, we have to transform them to factor. It's gonna be interesting though to think about it because I just wanna make a quick pin here and draw a, a small picture that we're gonna explore later. So let's say that my interest is not to compare the means of the nitrogen rates or potassium rates when it comes to yield, but I actually want to do a regression. I want to have numerical end rates on the x-axis, numerical yield on the y-axis, and I want to have a intercept slope regression. The only difference that we would have to change here is really to treat nitrogen rate or potassium rate as numerical. That has implications in the model as well, because now if we do that, the model is not going to try to estimate a mean for each one of these levels. It's actually going to try to estimate an intercept and a slope across those levels, right? So really, when your treatments are truly numerical, I guess, if you think about potassium rate and nitrogen rate, we still need to transfer them to factor or categorical if we want to do an ANOVA, which again, ANOVA, we're interested in means, mean comparison. I want to know if the mean yield of zero is different from the mean yield of 30 or 60 or so on. If I actually wanted to know the relationship over this, the range of the rates as a regression, I would leave them as numerical or double and do a regression instead, which ANOVA and regression are two words we use actually the same formula. It would still be LM or LMER, still the same formula to run it. The difference is how we are treating those explanatory variables. If we want ANOVA, they have to be categorical because I want the mean of them. I don't care that they're 0, 30, or 60. I want to know the mean of them. If I want to know the overall relationship, it would be a regression. I will leave them as numerical. So I just want to make that, that quick comment here. 
In our case, we're working with ANOVA. I want to know the mean response on each one of these levels. So I have to treat them as vectors. Okay, so uh, I left you the code for the wrangling here, which uh, in your, actually there's gonna be something that you're gonna have to code, which you don't have this block column yet, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come here right after that SPP or CBDTF, which is the raw data coming in. We're gonna use this function called rename, and you're gonna say block equals to rep. If I run this, it's not gonna work because it did not have a rep column. But in your case, if you just run until here, so if you do not do not add the pipe yet, leave it without a pipe and run just this piece of code and print it and print the SPP or CBDDFW below to make sure that now you do have a block column instead of a rep, it should have been renamed. Once you confirm that, just go ahead and add the pipe and run everything else should work as, as just as fine. Again, on my side, I'm going to comment off this rename because I already have a block column, but on your side, you can do that. Dr. Bastos. Yes. Wouldn't we need it the other way around? Uh, rep equals block, not block equals rep. So I, 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 if I if I remember the syntax here correctly, you specify the new name and then what the what the current name is. And if you do, you know, so on your well, I guess on my side, of course, the way I do here. So let's say that I do. So I have block already, right? So if I print my side, I already have block. If I wanted to rename block to rep, so I would do the opposite, right? So I would say, rep equals to block. And then if I printed, now that column is called rep. Yeah, so just confirming that on your side, you need this. You need to first say what is the new name you want to have, and then what's the current name. All right, so if that successfully worked, um, you should have now this new uh, data frame with 36 observations six columns uh, because we created a treatment name column now and also your block your end rate and your potassium rate should all be factored right that's what we did on the code here when we use the factor function on them so that was our very light wrangling of this data set before we get into the analysis All right. The summary as well, I just left, for, left that for you, but we already been through this, so there's nothing new at this point. The same thing with the plots, right? So it is the same data set. Um, and again, I just want to perhaps use this, this, this uh, opportunity to rem remind you that the raw data is remaining the same. We're not changing the raw data. We're changing the model, right? So we're changing the experimental design part of the model. Um, so these box plots at this point should look the same. What could be different though is the pairwise comparisons afterwards, because now we with a split plot we have two error, two sources of error, and that could change. I mean that will change the center error of the means. It can change the significance of the ANOVA terms. It could change the significance of pairwise comparisons and so on. But the raw data remains the same. So these box plots should look like what you already seen. So it does not seem like there's a strong um, effect of nitrogen rate. It does not seem there's a strong uh, potassium rate effect. However, it does seem like there is a interaction effect here. So we we have already ran in the previous exercise an RCBD with blocks as random. If you remember, when we treat something as random that creates two error sources now we have the error source associated with that random effect plus the residual error source that every model has if we only have a model that has fixed effect terms and therefore making that a fixed effect model we are only going to have the error associated with the residuals in which case we can use a function lm in r if we do have more than one error source in the case of treating one of the factors as a random effect, then LM does not work. It does not properly incorporate those two different sources of error into our errors of the model. So we have to use the LMER function 
that comes from the LME4 package. Just a quick reminder, um, the LME4 package is a very popular mixed effect model package in R. Uh, it was developed by Pinedo and Bates, who are the authors of that ebook I share with you. And we're on, on the repeated measure exercise that's gonna come after, we're, we're gonna be using a different package, still from the same authors, but it has a little bit more functionality that's going to allow us to play with the repeated measure side of it. Anyways, LME4 is one of the packages that those two uh, authors developed, very useful package for mixed effect models in R. All right, so I left you that options there. So we changed the contrast to sum to from set from set to zero to sum to zero, which is what we want um, most of the time in research. And you can start coding with me now in this next chunk where we're gonna develop the formula here. So we're gonna begin with LMER. That's the that's the name of the function. The first thing I want to give it is the formula. So um, I'm going to, let's see. Well, actually, let me just, the first thing I want to say is data, because then we can have the data set and print it below. So the data name is SPP underscore RCBD underscore DFW, and it has the W because it has been wrangled. So that's the version we want to use. If we just print that below, so we can look at the, the name of the columns. And we come back here to LMER, I'll give it a comma, I'm gonna break code. And then he has this argument called formula. So now this is where we give the formula. So if you remember, the first thing that we give it is the response variable. In our case, it's yield kilograms per hectare. So we say response variable yield kilograms per hectare, explained by, and for that we use the tilde notation. And then we start giving it the terms. Um, I want to propose that we first give the random effect side of this model. If you recall for LMER to provide or to make it understand that something is random it uses the following notation. So we open and close parentheses, you give a one in a vertical bar. And then after that vertical bar is when you tell the name of the factors or the name of the columns that you want it to be random. In our case, that's gonna be block. And this is not, we have not finished yet to specifying the random effects of a split plots, but for now, I just wanna leave it like this. And I wanna to move to the fixed effect parts of this model, which then we can just add a plus, and it's just gonna be potassium rate, asterisk, nitrogen rate. So this formula I'm showing you is the formula, the same formula that we used when we had an RCBD without split plots. This is the formula, okay? So this formula does not have yet in it any reference to a split plot design. What we are gonna have to change here to make that, to make the model understand this is a split plot and it has different error sources, it has different experimental unit sizes, is to come back to the random effects here where we have block and nest the potassium. So remember the potassium rate is what went on the whole plot, right? So we have blocks, whole plot potassium rate, split plot nitrogen. So we need to come on this formula here and tell it that potassium rate, which is the whole plot treatment factor, is nested in blocks. To do that, to for, for that notation in, in LMER, we just use the forward slash, and then we say potassium rate. So here, again, just to recap, we are explicitly saying that potassium rate levels are nested in blocks, and that is the only thing that lets this model know that this is a split plot. So again, notice how small of a difference this is and how easy it may be for you to run the wrong model, right? So it's just important for us to know what we're running and how to properly run the models that, that we have in the field or to represent the, what we have in the field with the models that we run. <clears throat> okay, and so another thing to notice here, which I think it's something that um, can be confusing. So I just wanna clearly say, if you notice here, potassium rate is part both of the random effect side of the model and also part of the fixed effect part of the model. 
And that is common in split plots. And that happens because nesting potassium rate in block is making sure that it's calculating two different error sources, one at the whole plot level, and then what's left is goes to the error, and that is the one that tests the split plot level. So first, potassium rate in the error term or in the random effect side of the model, because if we're specifying the proper error structure of the model with it. But then we also want to know the mean effect of potassium. So we're also interested in the means of the 0, 30, 60 levels of this treatment factor. So that's why it also appears in the fixed effects side of the model. Another thing to notice here is, and you're going to see this again on the repeated measure exercise, whenever we have, so because we have this nesting of error terms, we have a multi-level hierarchical level, hierarchical model, multi-level hierarchical model, because we have this nesting of error structure in this model. It's also called, you know, a split plot, mixed effect model. Um, those are all synonyms to refer to this, this thing here. And one thing I wanted to notice is always when you have a structure of things nested in other things. So in this case, if you really think about it, we have blocks inside of, so we have the blocks, inside of them we have the whole plots, inside of them we have the split plots. So why am I not specifying here that the split plot, so nitrogen is nested in potassium rate? The reason for that is because always the smallest level of nesting, you do not specify because then that goes into the residual, into the EIJ case of this model. So remember that by doing this, we're creating error terms that are random effects so our random effects are going to have error terms associated with them that we need to check assumptions for. But what's remaining from that goes into the error. So if I were to specify here that nitrogen rate in here, I'm not even sure if the model would run. It would say, like, I have nothing, I don't have a lower level left to assign that to the error. So that's the reason why it is a split plot, but we, on the random effects, we always leave out the last, the smallest component of the nesting, which in this case is nitrogen. So that's why it's not here, and it's just going straight into the, the residuals of the model. Okay, I, I talked, as I mentioned a lot of things. I know that you know they may not make full sense at this point, but I just wanna give a quick moment in case anyone has any questions. So what happens if we have a split split plot? So Ujwal is asking, what happens if we have a split split plot? So we have one more split, right? So let's say in our case here, just to give some context, if we had potassium rate as whole plot, nitrogen as split plots, and maybe variety as the split split plot, right? So we would have another column in this data set that would be variety that we have to also randomize within the split plot, right? So we would Randomize first the whole plot to block, split plots to whole plots, and then split split plots to the split plots, right? So there's all those nesting on the randomization. Here we will nest variety or then we will uh, nest randomly, right? Yeah. So, so, so here, if that was the case, you would then nest again here nitrogen rates, but then leave variety effects out of here because then that goes to the air. So always the smallest level of your hierarchy, you do not specify in the random effects because that needs to go to the error. In our case, make sure you do not leave it in right here because we don't have the variety in this, in this example here. All right, so let's go ahead and run this. Um, and we can ask for a summary of this model. I guess what I do want to show you here is what, what this turns out to uh, what what the specification of having potassium rate nested in block means when it comes to this to the summary here. So we have a, this random effects section of the summary where we have the interaction between potassium and block and then block by itself. Whenever we do that nesting, this is what that nesting breaks down as. It takes the the larger unit which appears first on the nesting formula and does the main effect of that. However, it does not take the main effect of the second part because it is nested. So it takes actually the main effect of block and then the interaction of block and potassium rate as well. So these two terms here are, are being pulled as the, so this is kind of interesting to, to think about. So these two terms, the block and potassium rate by block interaction, 
S and the random effect are being pulled and combined to make to make up the error of the whole plot. And then the residual is what's left. So that would be what's left of the nitrogen rape side of things. It's going to the EIJK residual of the model, and that's going to be used as the error for the split plot part of the model. So we see here that we're doing that breakdown uh, of the error into the random effect. And in this case, the random effect is also helping us to establish that relationship of split plot, and then what's going, what's being left in the residual and uh, being used at the split plot level. Then we have the fixed effect estimates here, which again, we in an ANOVA setting, I rarely look at these estimates um, because when we ask for the means, these estimates are combined in different ways to provide us the actual means that it's what we really care about. If this was a regression uh, exercise, these, these estimates would be more interesting, I guess. All right, so let's go ahead and check our ANOVA with a type three, uh, uppercase ANOVA, I left to the code there. <clears throat> This is, let's see. Yeah, I guess I guess in my head, you know, I'm developing the repeated measure exercise and also thinking back on the previous exercises. And I don't remember now, I think on previous exercises, this was, these were not significant. Is that right? Do you all remember? It not significant. Uh, in your side, it's still not significant? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they were not significant, but then it showed up here. I'm not quite sure. Let me let me refresh my environment and make sure that I have the same data as you. That is interesting. Uh, yeah, they should be non significant. I'm not sure why on my side they're not. Oh, I think I may, I think I know why. I think I forgot on my side to run the options to change the contrast type. Maybe that was it. Let me try again. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so that's, that, that, that was it. So I, on my side, um, I, forgot to run to change the contrast types from from the default that's set to zero to to what we want that is sum to zero. And it's been interesting, I guess, because even though I had not planned to show you the difference in this ANOVA table, but we kind of ended up seeing that there is an effect here. And that's why we need to change it. All right. Um, so again, on, on these ANOVA tables that we get, uh, we'll, we're only going to see the fixed effect side of the model, right? So the random effects are not going to be in this ANOVA table as they were when we we're walking through the lecture. It's just the, the way they show it uh, because we are really interested to see if the effects of the if the fixed effect part of the model are significant or not. The errors, the error, the random effect side of the model is just to properly establish our error terms. And reminding you again, um, because only our interaction is significant here, that's what we're gonna break down. In this specific exercise, I will also get the means of potassium rate and nitrogen rate main effects, so individually, just to show you how the errors are different, but not because we would do that in this case, uh, you know, for, I guess, reporting purposes, since we should focus on the interaction only for reporting purposes. All right, so let's check the model assumptions. I left you the code there as well. We're, we're loading this package called Broom Mixed. I believe you already have it because you needed that for the, the previous exercise. So I'm just loading that here, using the function augment to get the residual information and just creating the student ties residuals using the formula below. So we're just creating that data frame. Again, what we want to look for in here is independence of observations. And this 
you know, I guess this is a good point for us just to talk about this again. So the independence of observations is basically we do not want to see a pattern in the plot. Um, but it also comes largely from the fact that we know this was a randomized study, right? So we know we randomized it, so we're not expecting dependence. We are expecting independence. And then we check the residuals just to see if that if our hypothesis is true is is fulfilled, I guess. Um, in the case of repeated measures, we know from the beginning that we do not have independence because we have a time component or a spatial component that cannot be randomized. So we go into the analysis or, or checking the residuals already expecting that if there isn't if there is lack of independence, we're expecting that to be true, right? In the repeated measure case. In here, we come in expecting independence, but we're gonna check that still. Um, also, var variance homogeneity or homocedasticity, uh, also normality of the residuals, and then detecting all liars. And because we do have the random effects here of block and then uh, the interaction of block and potassium rate, we also want to check some assumptions or we want to check the assumptions of those using some of the plots as well. So if you come on the next chunk here, um, I am extracting the random effect components from the block and I wanna check. So if you remember, every time we have a variance component, either coming from the random effects or coming from the residual, we have that assumption that that term is gonna be IIDN, so identically, independently distributed normal with a mean of zero and a variance coming from that term. So we want, that's what we want to check here is that those assumptions are fulfilled. So if we give it the assignment symbol, we use the function run f for random effects. And we are just going to give our model name, which is spp underscore rcbd underscore mix underscore mods. So we have that as your type is going to start appearing so you can just select once you find it. Make sure you give it the model and not the data frame. So if we run this and you print it, there's going to be two components of it. So the first that's going to give us here is that interaction of potassium rate and block, and then it's going to give us the block one. We're going to check both of them, but in this chunk here, I want to check the block. So we're just going to give it the, the dollar sign and block to pull out only that block component from this list. But if we do that, then this becomes a data frame that has a column called intercept and then the values there. So these values are a little bit different than the actual residual residuals because the residual residuals are gonna be the difference between the predicted and observed. In this case here, it's it's a little bit different, right? It's not, it's not exactly that because it's more on the variance level. Um, so these numbers are not, they don't really look like it's a predicted versus observed value. So I left you the code here for us to do the QQ plot of the block random effect. You can just go ahead and run it. We have already built this code before, so you should be familiar with it already. Again, we have only four blocks, so it's really hard to make strong, um, I guess, to, to really you know have a strong evidence either that we are fulfilling or, or not fulfilling the assumptions here. You know, with only four points, it's hard to really calculate a normal distribution, but it kind of seems like it's okay, right? It's not, doesn't seem terrible um, departure from that, that the theoretical line that, that we're, we're comparing to. Hey, Dr. So, Bastos? Yes. Can you scroll back up to the previous chunk? I think I clicked the wrong data set or something because Oh, I forgot to add the dollar sign block. I yeah. apologize. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's just more for sanity check. Uh, it doesn't look bad, uh, but also we only have four observations. So it's hard to, or we only have four blocks. Sorry, not four observations. We only have four blocks, and that's why we only have four values here. So limiting us in how much we can tell about these residuals. But they, they, don't, they don't, don't seem like we need to worry about them. All right, so the next thing that we want to check is the same thing, but for that interaction between block and potassium rate. So we're going to use the same approach. We're going to call that function run f for random effects. 
Um, we're going to give the model name again, which is the same model. So SPP underscore RCBD underscore mix underscore mods. Make sure you get the mods. If just, just as before we ran this and printed below, you do get these two components. In this case here, it may be easier if you just copy the dollar sign from the list and paste. Because one thing that happens here is every time you have special characters as part of object names or columns, in this case here, the special character is the colon. If we do not have those apostrophes before and after, it thinks that these two things are objects and that you're trying to get something out of them, which is not the case. Right. These are just this is a name. So we do need the apostrophes there just to make sure R understands this is a full name and not try to interpret the parts of the name. All right. So we run that. Uh, we again get to have this data frame uh, with, in this case, now 12 values. Why do we have 12 values here? Yeah, that's it, right? So four blocks and three potassium rates. That gives us 12 values here. And then you really can see how these values are being estimated for each block by potassium rate level, which is what we specified, right? So we want that variance component to be uh, to come from from those from those different groups. I left you again the code here, so you can just go ahead and run it. You know, now we do have 12 points, so it's a little bit easier to compare and, and make better inference about it. They look pretty good as far as I'm concerned, so I wouldn't worry about, um, I would say that the normality assumption here on our random effects check. All right, so we, we checked our assumptions for the random effects, but now let's check the assumptions of the residual error, which is again, what every model has, regardless if the model is a fixed or mixed effect model. So this is the residuals for our I, I or EIJK um, term of our model that we already looked many times, have the same assumptions. Now the, you know, I, I guess uh, we've seen this on the slides already, but I just want to point out again here in the code. So the variance components coming from the random effects have their own variance, which is different from the variance that is associated with the residuals. And because they have different variances, because we're telling that they have different variances, we want those to be calculated separately. Um, we we want to check those assumptions where the assumption on the random effects was, you know, IIDN with a mean zero and a variance of that related to that specific effect. So in this case, the variance of block and then the variance of um, a block by potassium rate. And then here is the variance of the error when we come to the within error group, um, within group errors or re model residuals. It's a different variance. So it's, we need to re retest the assumptions again. All right, so I left you the code already there. You can just go ahead and run it. It looks very similar to the one that we had previously when blocks were random, but we did not have a split plot. Maybe one difference that I was able to, to, to tell. So we still have this, this sort of pattern and we talked about, I wasn't too worried about it because it was not, the, the error band was touching zero on the Y axis for the whole range of the X axis values. In this case here, this now that we ran as a split plot, that's not the case. It's a little bit lower on the side. But it's still, I don't think I would greatly worry about it. Also, because of the fact that this study, just want to remind you, this study was not actually implemented as a split plot. It was an RCBD that we are using for teaching purposes and running as a split plot. So it could also be related to that. But anyways. I'm, I'm not too concerned here. So everything that we checked off before, so it seems like they're independent. Uh, the variance seems to be homocedastic. We don't have this fan shape in this plot. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to worry if these uh, dots will be above or below those red lines, right? 
Yeah, so if we so the, the rule of thumb is to consider an outlier if they are above three or below minus three on the on the normalized residual scale. So in this case, we normalize using the studentized residual. So that would be when we consider outliers. And even even I mean, if you have you know something that's that's like close, like above but close to the to, to those boundaries, it's still you know it's a it's a hard rule just to give us some some numbers to to compare to but it's at the same time you know i mean i mean if something like i don't know 10 on the scale or minus 10 really outside of the of of everything else then it's something that you really want to take a closer look at and see what's going on and we already talked about you know how we can address our liars in some of the ways as far as going back checking if the data is correct if there was no data entry error there was no lab equipment error there's no field equipment error or whatever it could be. Um, and then if there was, then we can safely remove them. If there was not, then that requires some more playing around with it and trying to understand what to do. But in this case here, everything checks, so I'm not, not worried about it. Um, I left you another plot here, which is that uh, the QQ plot for the residuals. Of course, now we have a lot more points because we have 36 observations, so 36 residual points to compare to. Does not seem like there is a departure from normality. And also when we look at the density plot to also check normality in a different way, it seems like pretty, pretty much centered around zero and looks pretty normal to me. So I wouldn't, wouldn't worry too much. All right, so the next thing is for us to extract the means. Um, I think, you know, from this point on here, it's really, it goes back to being similar to the, what we were doing before, right? So we had the interaction significant. Uh, we already talked about in previous classes of if you have an interaction significant, how do you extract those means and do the pairwise comparisons and how that impacts your um, um, interpretation of, of how you show your data. In this case, I just want to get all comparisons of, of everything together so there is no structure in my means, which is, is perhaps is an interesting to point that we do have a structure, in the, a structure in the design. However, we're talking about means and how I extract means. So in the means, I, I'm choosing to not, to not have a structure when doing that. So you can just run that. <clears throat> We see here, uh, you know, we have this inner arrow of these means. And here's interesting because since we are getting the means from the interaction, this error here that we're seeing on these means is being is coming partially from the whole plot error and partially from the split plot error because we are asking for means that are an interaction between those those two levels that are at different unit sizes. So this error here is a combination of those two errors in this case. So what I do, even though we would not do this normally, we would not get the main effects of potassium rate, nitrogen rate for two reasons. One, they were not significant. So we wouldn't get the means, or at least, I mean, you could get the means and show them, but you would not really make you know a lot of interpretation on them because in this case, they were not significant, but also, because the interaction was significant. So even though if the main effects would have been significant, we would still base our interpretation on the interaction means. So we would not extract potassium and nitrogen rate means main effects by themselves. I do wanna do that here just so we can see uh, what, they, what the error of those means are, because that, that's gonna allow us to understand also the different error sources on the split plot. So what I want to ask you to do here is we're just going to use the EM means function. We're not even going to, we're not assigning this to an object. It's just like, I just want to print this for us to visualize. So we give the object name, that's SPP underscore RCBD underscore mix underscore mods. That's our model object. And I just want to ask for potassium rate. So I just give it the tilde and say K rate, KG hectare. So remember, this is the error coming from the whole plot level. So when I look at the means of potassium, you see the error, the standard error of those means is 232. 
which is lower than the error from when I get the means of the of the interaction, right? So the interaction is pulling error from both sources, both whole plot and split plots. In this case, potassium rate is the whole plot unit and the error is, is lower than that of the interaction. Now let's do the same for nitrogen rates, just so we can visualize it. So the same thing, in, well, actually, if you wanna just copy and paste the code that you wrote above, that may save you a few seconds. The only difference here is that instead of potassium rate, we wanna give a nitrogen rate. So when you ask for the nitrogen rates, you can see that the standard error is 209, right? So if you compare here, the standard error of the nitrogen rate means is lower than that of the potassium rate means. This happens because this is a split plot. And again, split plot has two different sizes of experimental units, which makes it also have two sources of error. One that happens at the whole plot, one that happens at the split plot level. And we're seeing that here. So when we get the means for potassium rate, which is at the whole plot level, the means of the, or the error of those means is higher than the error of the means for nitrogen, which is at the split plot level. We already talked about this in class that on a split plot, you have this trade-off. You have more power, more precision uh, at the split plot level because you have more replications of that split plots. And you have less power, less precision at the whole plot treatment factor because you have less uh, replicates at that level. And when you get the interaction, it pulls, it combines both of these errors into a formula. And that's why our whole plot error I'm sorry, our interaction means error is larger because it's pulling from both sources. If you think about it, what if the, if you go back to your exercise where we ran this as a randomized complete block design without the split plot structure, the errors, if you were to get the means for potassium separately, nitrogen separately and interaction, the error of those means would all be the same. They should not change because in an RCBD like we had before, we have only one error source I'm sorry, well, we do have two error sources. Let me, let me, let me fix that. We do have two error sources because block is still random. However, the, the error coming from the random effect and the error coming from the residual are the same for all of the factors because there is no structure in the factors themselves. In this case here, we do have two error sources, but they are being structured differently when we look at means because of the structure of the split plots. So I see some confused faces. <laughs> I don't know if you're just processing what I'm saying or if you're like, this is just going right above your head. So let me ask you, was, um, does anyone have any questions that may help you better understand this? If you did not understand, maybe you understood you're just processing, but if you did not understand, is there anything that I can clarify? No, so so Benita, so just to repeat that for those online. So Benita was asking if we had just the significant effect of the main effects, so just potassium by itself, just nitrogen by itself, and maybe the interaction was not significant. Does that have any implications on how we do pairwise comparisons, given that this is a split plot? No, really, it doesn't, right? So because to, if you, to, I guess to, to follow up on that, so the split plot is just making sure that your errors are being properly attributed to the different hierarchies that you have in this study. In that when, when you do ask for means and pairwise comparisons, that the proper errors are being used. So that's what the split plot is doing for you when it comes to the analysis side. Now, if that does not, that, the fact that it is a split plot should not influence the way that you would think of which means to extract and to compare. That is regardless of the design itself, right? The design is taking care of the error structure for you. So when you do look at the ANOVA and decide which terms to extract means and do pairwise comparisons, it, the split plot is just making sure that those errors are appropriate. But the fact that this is split plot should not, should not impact how you interpret 
the way that you should expect the means in duplicate comparisons. So in this case, if only the main effects were significant, we would just look at the main effects, right? And then make those plots for that. Show do the do the the um, so here we're just getting the means because my goal was to show you the center error, but then you would get the pairwise comparisons and do the plot and so on, right? Um, and really that again, that is just making sure that the proper errors are being used because so if you think about it, all so the variability in this model is either falling into the random effects or in the residual of the model. And by properly modeling them to be where they should be given your design is gonna make sure that when you look at your ANOVA, those p-values are gonna be incorporating this information. So the p-values are gonna be calculated properly on the ANOVA table, right? So that when we look at the ANOVA table, right? So when we look at this ANOVA, it's gonna make sure that these p-values are valid, that they're being based on the proper center errors. And also when you do get the means and you do pairwise comparisons, you know, because really a lot of the, the behind the scene, a lot of the work is being done by EME and CLD for us, but but those com those letters that we get in the end are doing a pairwise comparison of each one of the two means, comparing the means and also uh, their associated errors, right? And so this error that we're seeing here is is trickling through the, the, the pairwise comparisons as well. So if you have the proper error going through the CLD, that makes sure that your comparisons are valid, even if your error may be greater than if you had mistakenly treated this as a RCBD without split plots. Because remember, the goal here is not to have the lowest error necessarily, even though that's nice if you do, but the goal here is to make sure that the proper errors are representing what happened on the field, even if that means that your error increases. But if that's what happened on the field, that's what you get. Right. All right, that was a very long answer to your question, but. All right, any other questions? Okay, so I don't hear anything. We can just keep going. I have some text here that I that I wrote some of those those points for you in case you want to come back and revisit them. Um, but that's basically just going through what it's the conversation we just had. <clears throat> so if we come back to the to the scenario that we're just doing the comparison for the interaction because that's what was significant, that's what we should show. You can go ahead on this next chunk here and run it. So we get those first comparisons performed. Um, I left you the code for uh, doing the wrangling on this so we can plot it. You can just go ahead and run that as well. And I left you the code already for the plot. So if you run here, it should already create you a plot and export that. And now I just want to take, you know, a quick, I don't know, two minutes here, three minutes, just ask you to pair it with with someone. Uh, if you if you if you are not in a classroom with someone else, you're gonna have to do this by yourself. But what I wanted you want you to do is this export, so I just want you to compare this plot. So this plot here that we just did for treating the treating this design as a split plot, randomized complete block design with blocks as random. So go through this plot that we just created and compare these letters to the letters that you got from when we we just did the RCBD. So the the so the the immediately previous exercise where we did only RCBD with blocks random. You don't have to rerun everything. If you want, you can just go to that project, go on that output folder and just open this, this plot. If you ran the plots on your side and maybe, I guess we don't have to pair because yeah, maybe we can just look on, on our sites because since you're not gonna be running code and just look at the plot that you have already created, I guess you can just do individually. So comparing this plot here with, and looking at the letters especially, Comparing that with when you, we ran this as RCBD with blocks as random.
All right, so um, let's let's just talk about this very very briefly here. So the first thing is um, the means should be still the same, right? So when we because what we're doing on the split plot is changing the error structure, so that impacts the variance variance components, but it should not impact the means. So the means should be the same. Now the error around those means and how that impacts pairwise comparisons should change because now we're specifying this different structure of the design on the split plots that the RCBD without a split plot do not have. All right, so I'm sure that you noticed that some of the letters changed. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not looking closely to see if our overall interpretation would change. Perhaps it wouldn't but still the letters changed. And that is because we're, we're using different standard errors of those pairwise comparisons from one design to the next. This is something that we're, again, we're doing this as a teaching exercise just for us to go through and understand how running the proper model in the field, but also specifying the proper model when you come back to, your, to the lab and analyze this in your computer is important. Very rarely we actually have you know, side-by-side -side studies that you're doing the same study, same treatments, just a different design. Very rarely people have that type of data. This is not that, right? This is just us taking one data set from one design and just playing with it. So it's, it's normally not easy to know, okay, if I had run this as a different design, what would have happened? It's difficult to know, right? Because we don't have both of those designs happening at the same time, the same conditions, same treatments, all that. <clears throat> Um, so my, my main takeaway here is that with your data, you're not going to have the chance of playing around and checking. So the best thing to do is to know your design, to plan well your design before you implement your study, collect your data. When you come back to your computer, to know that you're running the right model for the design that you implement in the field and stick with it. So that was my, my takeaway here. All right, um, so that wraps up this coding exercise. Uh, the next thing is gonna be a lecture. I do wanna give you all a five minute break in case you need to go to the restroom because we're going to 11.30 today. So feel free to take a break if you want. We'll start talking about repeated measures at 10.40.
All right, let's uh, resume here after our break. So I guess one thing I forgot to ask you to do is if you go back to your 05 SPP project, I do wanna ask you to stage, commit, and push. So let's go ahead and do that. You can say something like finished, SPP exercise on your commit or whatever you wish. <clears throat> Commit it and then close the window and push. Right. Okay, so the lecture that we are going to go through now is on the website, is under uh, today's class, there's a link there that's for the repeated measure lecture in case you want to follow or take notes. All right. So the goal of this of this lecture is for us to explore some of the key concepts related to repeated measures. Um, so we're going to revisit the independence assumption um and understand when we are knowingly violating that assumption how that relates to repeated measure analysis and go through some of the correlation structure types that we're going to be using here so the the uh, to bring back our motivational example so i do want to, so if you remember we started analyzing this data as a crd so that was the simplest design then we did an RCBD with blocks as fixed. And then we did an RCBD with blocks as random. Then we did a split plot with RCBD with blocks random. That is the latest one we did. That's the most complex one that we've seen this far. Um, so I do want to continue with that most complex example that we've seen as we, I guess, start talking about repeated measures. So still assuming we have a two-way factorial that is um, in a split plot where the whole plot is the potassium rates, split plot is nitrogen rates. We still have our nitrogen combinations. And this is all in a randomized complete block design with four blocks. However, I up until now, we've been, our response variable has been yield, which is something that for most commonly you assess one time at the end of the season, right? So you go there, you harvest one time, you have this one time measure that you're using as your uh, response variable. However, I did, so the data set that we're gonna go through is based on real data, but it's fake data in the same time because I created the, the data set and what I am proposing, and, and I did that so we could keep with the same design and we can keep with a similar or a familiar study as we get into a more complex topic. So what I, the story I made up here is, you know, so this crop I think was wheat, but let's say if you think of maybe a forage crop where you may come and harvest multiple times during the season, you're harvesting multiple times the same plot. So assuming a similar situation here, but again, with our same design with nitrogen potassium rates, let's say that we were to come to this study and harvest those plots four times in, in one season. So you come and harvest at a given time, you come back another time and do that four times. And then we have this new research question, which is, is there an interaction between treatment, in our case, nitrogen and potassium rates and time? So harvest time, harvest time in this case. And does the treatment effect change over time? So am I getting more or less yield as I make multiple harvests? Or maybe how do treatments compare at any given time point? So if you think about it, for me to do this, our data is gonna have to have a few new columns, which we're gonna have four new columns where each one of them are gonna be yield at a given point in time in four different times. Now, I do need to have a column that's gonna be time. 
right? So in this case here, the way I'm proposing this column to be named is days after planting. So we're gonna have a given number of days after planting that we come and harvest these plots, and they're gonna be four different days after planting in this case. So if I do want to assess the effect of time, I have to have that column, in our case, we're calling days after planting as part of my model. If, so imagine that now our fixed effect terms of the model, we're gonna have potassium rate, nitrogen rate, and time. However, I did not randomize time, and that's the problem. So I guess just to set, set the, the motivation example here, um, we, we are measuring this case yield over time from the same plots, and we want to analyze the effect of time in our model. How can we do that? I decided to sh not show you the effects model as we've been seeing up until now, because I think it would be a lot of terms that may actually have made this more confusing, and I did not want that to be the case. So instead of showing you the effects model, I'm showing you the model that we would run in LMER. Right, so it would be to still have, we still have this column called yield. We're defining our split plot error terms by nesting potassium rate in block and having that as a random effect. And now we have potassium rate, asterisk, nitrogen rate, asterisk, F depth. And I have the F there just because this is gonna become more important when we get to the coding side of it, but I'm treating days after planting as a factor. That's why I have an F in front of it. So if this is my model that I want to run. Um, and, and again, just the, that random effect is setting the random effects uh, structure of this model. Then we have the fixed effects and the F depth as the factor days after planting, which has four levels. So we're harvesting it four times. Now, if we revisit the linear mixed model assumptions related to that model, right? So we do have the random effect of in this case, I'm showing you the interaction of potassium and block, that is IIDN, so independently, identically distributed normal with a mean of zero and a sigma square of alpha rho, is that? I guess I, I forget that. But anyways, P, I'm gonna call it P. Uh, but then we also have the assumption of the error or residual, which is the within subject variability that goes to your EIJKs, that last term that every model has. So all the assumptions we're checking is because of these two sentences, right? This is what sets the assumptions that we then go and check. Now, if we think about it, the the the, the assumption that our residuals, so the E, I, J, K are independent of one another is largely based on the fact that we can randomize those treatments to the experimental units. And that's what gives us to start off the bat or right out the bat, that assumption of independence is because you can randomize, right? And the way that this, and you know, I think a lot of times we talk about these assumptions and you know we know there is an assumption, but we don't really see how, why do we have that assumption and how is that part of the model? How does it impact the model? So what I decided to do, um, well, I guess before I show that, I'm gonna go, go through this last sentence here. So the assumption of independence is basically in the model and we do not see this as behind the scenes is on a matrix format, but in the model, when, when the model is being trained, is basically setting to zero the correlation between any two observations. Because if they're independent, they should not be correlated. And that assumption is based on randomization. So what I did here was for, so imagine now our study, our RCBD study, block one, the first whole plot, the first split plot of that design that we've been seeing. I'm pulling here the matrix of the error of those four observations where each of the, so we have one observation being, so each one of the columns in rows are one harvest time for the first block, first whole plot, first split plot. So on that one split plot, we harvested four times, okay? So I'm showing you here the correlation matrix behind the scenes for that very specific plot. This happens for all, all plots, all data points in this data set. I'm just showing you one for simplicity. 
So what that correlation structure of the air of the EIJK of this model looks like for that one plot that was harvested four times is this. So on the diagonal, we have a one. This just means this is the this is the variance of that. This represents the variance of that observation because if you imagine here that one, two, three, and four are the, are the different harvest times, they're appearing both on the rows and on the columns. So if you have harvest time one on the row, harvest time one on the column, their variance equals to one because it's the same, it's the equivalence, the same observation. Same thing for the harvest time two on the row and also on the column, that variance is the same. So on the on the diagonal of this of this matrix, we have the variances, which are one in this case, because they're the same for the same observation. And then the off diagonal values that you're seeing here are all zero. And that's where the correlation is set. By default, the models we run, this is what they assume, that your off diagonal values of this matrix, which is the matrix of the error of the EIJ case, the off diagonal values will always be zero by default because of that assumption of independence, right? So if you think about it, the variability of that first, first harvest time and second harvest time is being assumed to be, or that correlation between the first and second harvest time are assumed to be zero. However, in this case, that may not be true because harvest time is over time. We cannot randomize time so maybe this assumption of a zero correlation is not good. It's not a good assumption for this case. But I just wanted to, I guess, illustrate to you that we talk about these assumptions, but I guess not every time we see why we are making that assumption and how that assumption translates to what affects the model. This is, this is that, right? This is the matrix that's being assumed for, again, that first, so first block, first whole plot, first split plot, harvested four times. These are those, those four time harvests. This is how that matrix looks like by default for every model, right? So every model that we do not have a repeated measure um, model fitting exercise, I guess, or, or every model we did not run as a repeated measure will assume this, that the correlation between two observations is zero or two residuals is zero because we randomize. That's the assumption. So again, the diagonal values represent a common variance. Um, and it's one for every time that you have the same observation in the row and the column. And the off diagonal are the shared correlation, which is zero, that's the assumption. However, randomization is not always possible. And in this case that we have our motivation example is a good example of that because we cannot randomize time of harvest, right? I cannot say that I first harvested, I don't know, at a hundred days and then it came back later and harvested in 90 days. It does not work that way. Time is a one directional um, you know, dimension. So we, we, we cannot really randomize that. So this happens repeated measure types of problems and therefore analysis, even though the name, if you can you get the intuition repeated measure, it seems like it's repeated over time, but it can be either time or space because we also cannot randomize space, right? We talked about if you go and take a soil sample at three different depths and you want to compare across depths. So I want to say potassium was higher on the top layer compared to the bottom layer. That is also repeated measure because you cannot randomize depth. It is something that's it's set, right? You cannot randomize them. So a few examples here of uh, when time can appear in your analysis in in you should treat that as measures or space. So in time, we're mostly talking about one directional, right? So time moving forward in one direction. So this could be, if you're measuring anything, like we're talking about yield, you could be measuring plant height, any sensory information, any other thing that you're measuring on that plot. Um, as you know, So if you're doing that at different crop stages or maybe days after planting, days after application of some type of input, those are all variables you can have in your data table and model that represent time and others that, but these are just some, some examples, right? So days after incubation as well. And then space um, is, is normally, normally a two dimensional um, case 
where perhaps the first example I've given you is more one dimensional where we have soil depth. So we have just like on the Z axis perhaps. But then this is really used a lot in when you have geospatial data. So precision ag, whenever you have geospatial data, this is very useful because now you have, you have X and Y coordinates of where things are happening, right? So we can incorporate those also as part as repeated measure in space. Okay, so we have the assumption. We are coming in already with the hypothesis of we're breaking that assumption because again, we cannot randomize time and space. Now, how do we fix that? That's what repeated measure analysis is about, is trying to fix that, that the, the assumption that we're not meeting in relation to independence. So what we do then is we're going to relax this assumption. So with the with the default model that we have that it, it assumes a correlation of zero, it does it does not even try to estimate the correlation. It already says it is zero because we're randomized. So we're going to relax that assumption to different extents and let the model estimate it give us an estimation of what that correlation may be using different ways, where some ways are going to be very simplistic, other ways are going to be more complex. There are going to be trade-offs there. And once we do that, so we, we, we allow our model to try different correlation structures on that error matrix, then we check to see which one of those models did the best job at this. And then that's the one that we select and then we move forward with uh, inference. So we're basically relaxing the assumption, checking a whole bunch of ways to calculate that, that correlation, and then choosing the best model from that point on. Overall, there are two families, larger families of correlation structures that we're gonna be exploring. One of them is called serial correlation structures which happen mostly with, when you have time as a repeated measure variable. And then there are spatial correlation structures, which we use more when we have spatial repeated measures. So let's talk about those two classes and then get into them afterwards to see what are some examples that we're gonna actually explore in the, in the coming exercise next week. So beginning with the serial correlation structures, again, those are the ones that would be most associated with time. So one dimensional uh, repeated measure. The three main types that we're gonna see here, one is called compound symmetry. The other one is called general. The other one is called autoregressive moving average. So let's get into each one of them and understand what they are, or at least try to understand. This is a little bit difficult to understand in slides uh, but I think it helps when you combine what you see here with what we do on the exercise later. So the compound symmetry of all the correlation structures that we allow to be calculated or computed, the compound symmetry is the simplest one. Um, and that is going to assume equal correlation among errors of the same group. Let me just take a quick moment here to dissect that sentence a little bit more. First, what do I mean by a group? That's an important thing to know. Whenever we're running repeated measures, we want to make it very clear to the model what is the unit that the repeated measure is happening. Is it the block? Is it the whole plot? Is it the split plot? Where is that happening? Right. So in this case here, in our 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 case, it's happening at the split plot plot level. Right. So if you think of our our data table, it would be that column that we had like S plots that was like 101-1, 101-2, that's the level that repeated measure is happening. So it is, that is the group that is considering here. And then it's assuming that all those times within that unit have the same correlation. You know, so it's basically saying the, that the correlation between time one and time two. So let's say that you harvest at 100. I think I had these numbers in the exercise, but now I'm just going to make some up. So some, some of them up. So if you have, if you harvested 100, 120, 140, and 160 days after planting, so have four timings separated by 20 days each that you do the harvest, it's assuming that the first harvest that happened at 100 days after planting is just as related to the second harvest as it is the first to the last one. 
that is probably not a good assumption because one thing to keep in mind is that things that are closer in space or time are more likely are likely to be more correlated than things that are farther away, both in space and time, right? So it's probably not the best assumption to assume that all those times on this plot are equally correlated. But anyways, this is the simplest one, compound symmetry. Because it is one of the simplest ones, it also, part of that re reflects on how many parameters it needs to estimate to be calculated, which in this case is just one. This is going to be a trade-off, and I'm going to see this on the next slide. Uh, so for now, I'm just going to pin that, and when we get to the next slide, I'll, I'll tell you more about why this is important. And so this probably is a too simplistic of an approach for time series, as things, again, that are closer in time and space are going to be more correlated than things that are farther away uh, or apart. And this is basically saying that everything, all those four sampling times are equally correlated. So I pulled up here again for you a correlation matrix structure for the four yield measurements of the first plot. So block one, whole plot one, split plot one. We're talking about this split plot here and all the four harvests that happen in that split plot. So notice now that our diagonal values are still one. So the variance is still assumed to be equal across all of them. However, notice that now instead of having zeros, I have a 0 0.3 value of correlation for any given combination of harvest times. So this is what compound symmetry does behind the scenes is it calculates this correlation, assuming it is equal for all the different time levels that you have. I just wanna go back to the previous slide so you can see what the default is when you do not have a compound symmetry. Maybe a few more slides. So this is what we would have by default, right? So the variance equal on the diagonal, the off diagonal values that represent the correlation set to zero. This is not even estimated. It is assumed to be zero, set to zero from the beginning because we have randomization. Now the compound symmetry example gives a little bit of flexibility. It says, okay, maybe there is some correlation, but I'm going I'm only gonna let you estimate one value and that value is gonna be the same for everything. So that's what it's doing here. The next one, so the next class is called general. There may be a different ways of referring to this depending on the literature. It could be general, it could be unstructured, but this is the other end of the spectrum. This is where you're, you're allowing a correlation value to be calculated for each, each pair of observations, right? So now you're being completely liberal. You're saying compute as many as you need. So it is the most complex. Uh, where the, co the correlation between any two pairs of data or residuals is going to be a different, or it could be a different parameter because we're letting the model calculate those many parameters. And because we are being very liberal in how we can handle this by calculating any number of parameters needed here, the number of parameters increased quadratically with the maximum number of observations within a group. So it's the more observations you have in this group, the more times, the more harvest times you have here, the more parameters is going to allow it to calculate uh, as well. So you may think, well, that's great. I mean, my model is going to be super flexible. We're going to be able to calculate all these these correlations. However, we only have thirty six observations in our case. Maybe if you have a very large data set where you're doing this, it may work. But normally, that's not the case with experimental design data. In our case, we have 36 observations. So allowing this matrix to calculate a different value for each off-diagonal space in this matrix is probably going to lead to an over-parameterized models. And what, what that ends up happening is that a lot of times this model doesn't even fit. You can try to fit this model. It, it does not converge because you don't have enough data to calculate all of these parameters. So even though it is an option, but it's probably a better option if you have a lot of data. If you don't have a lot of data, it may not even converge and that's not gonna work for you. So again, I'm just pulling here the, the correlation error matrix of that first plot and the, and the four harvest times for that plot. So again, we see that the variance, the diagonal values, the variance are all one. So assume the same. 
and we're allowing the off diagonal values to change here. And now they can be different values, right? Now they're all estimated separately, uh, which is what this, this type of um, correlation structure allows. So compound symmetry is computing one. General or unstructured is computing as many as you have pairs in this matrix. So very um, restrictive on the compound symmetry, very liberal on the general one. Now I want to introduce you to here to perhaps a family of, of serial correlation structures, which the overall topic, and I'm using this overall topic because that's how it's being referred to in the book that I share with you. So in case you use that as a resource, you can connect back to that. So in the book, they, they introduced this as autoregressive moving average. However, there are two parts of that. If we first talk about the autoregressive part is where a current observation is going to be a function of previous observations. What do we mean by that? So for that first part that we have, we would go there and we would go on the second harvest. And I was going to say, this second harvest is a function of what happened on the previous harvest, on the, previous, on the first harvest in that case. Or maybe the third harvest is a function of what happened on the second harvest and so on. So it is autoregressive because it's using the what happened in the past to calculate the correlation with of that to what is currently happening on the on that on that on a given time step. So the way that this works is you can choose how many lag points. So how many points in the past you want to incorporate into this relationship. So the so let's say if I just want to go back one step in time. So if I want to go, let's say if I'm estimating the correlation between the second harvest time and the first. Wait, that's not a good example. Erase that. If I want to estimate the correlation between the third harvest time and the first one, and I use... I just want to use one lag, you would just do the correlation of that third time with the second time. But if I use a two lag, uh, in this case, you would do the third with the second and the first. So it's it has that flexibility and we can, this is a parameter that we can give to the model. And then how many lags you use here, that's going to define what is the autoregressive P here. P is going to be the number of lags. So it would be AR1 autoregressive order one is the most common one where you just go one step back in time to calculate that, that correlation. And then you're gonna have uh, the number of parameters that the model is going to estimate will depend on, um, on how many steps you're going back in time. So this, uh, the, the, the autoregressive order one. So when you go one, one step back in time is perhaps the only one of the serial correlation structures that allows you to treat, to use this with continuous non-equally spaced time measurements. So if we talk about the compound symmetry and if we talk about the general structure, it needs for at times to be integers and also to be equally spaced. So you have to have the interval between your times should be the same for all the times. Now the AR1 is has some flexibility that allows you to, to use this when that is that condition is not met. So if you do not have continuous non-equally space. So let's say if I did a harvest time at 100, 105, 120, 140, 150. So we have different intervals between those dates. This uh, autoregressive order one allows you to, to run that as well. So here is the correlation matrix structure for for again the same the same observation we're talking we're looking at. So again the diagonal remains one, so the variance is the same. And now if if a correlation value here that it was calculated was 0.8, you can see that one lag. So going back one time is 0.8, and then that decreases uh, over time. So these are not all estimated. It estimates the first one, and then the other ones are just a decaying function of the first one. But now here it makes more sense, right? Because it's telling you that observation or time harvest time one and two have an eighty percent or a zero point eight correlation, and then one and three have a lower correlation. One and four have an even lower correlation. So it makes sense that things that are farther away are less correlated to things that are 
closer, either in time or space. So the AR1 is going to be probably one of the most important ones that you're going to be using and exploring uh, as you're modeling repeated measures. <clears throat> All right, so that was the autoregressive part of it. There is this moving average part of it, which what it means is that there's still going to be a relationship there, but it's calculated differently. So the current observation is a linear function of independent and identically distributed noise terms. So what this means is that, I mean, there is a mathematical formula behind this that I am not showing you just for simplicity's sake. If you do want to see the whole mathematical um, derivation of this, it is in that, in that resource I shared with you. But this is just basically saying that instead of just using the previous time value and distance, is actually using that and the, the, um, the residual from those two, those two terms. So it's a little bit more complicated. And uh, the way, it, but the concept is a little bit different of the calculation that's doing, but the implementation is very similar to the autoregressive where you have this term called Q, where is the number of, um, the number of noise terms that are gonna be included as part of that correlation calculation. And then the way that you refer to it is using this MA for moving average Q notation to say how many, of those points in the past are being included here. Similarly to the autoregressive, you're going to have Q correlation parameters in a, in a auto in a moving average Q model. So let's say if you have a moving average two, you're going to have two correlation parameters being estimated. And then you can combine both of those things in the same uh, approach as well, where we have autoregressive and moving average together. Uh, these are called ARMA or ARIMA models. Um, when you combine both of those properties. So the number of parameters being estimated are gonna be P, P plus Q is gonna be the total number of parameters being estimated. So it's still um, you know, not, not very liberal like the general. It has a few more parameters than just the autoregressive or just the moving average, but it's still one example. I don't know if we're gonna actually see this in our example in class. Um, but I just wanted you to be aware of it because if you do, so we're, you know, introducing these topics and there are, there are more serial structures that I could show you. There are more spatial structures that I could show you, but I'm showing you the ones that will be mostly, most of them are going to be implementing. And then once you, you develop this intuition of what they are, what they mean, um, it becomes easier to try new ones that we have not seen in class if you, if you wish so. All right, so we talked about serial correlation structures. That was the compound symmetry, the general, the um, autoregressive moving average classes. Those are all serial. Those are all used for temporal data. Um, and they, except for the autoregressive order one, all of the others require your time intervals to be equally spaced and to be integers. Now let's talk a little bit about spatial correlation structure. So this would be getting more into the spatial side of repeated measures, getting away from the temporal side, getting into the spatial side of repeated measures. So this is gonna be used to model continuous two-dimensional data. And I'm highlighting continuous here, just so you're aware that all of these are gonna work with continuous data that are not equally spaced, right? That is a condition we have a lot. I mean, it's gonna be very difficult for you to measure things equally spaced in the precision ag approach, if you think of it. So this, these matrices allows, allow you to use continuous data with them. And even though they are spatial in nature, but because they have this flexibility of working with continuous non-equally spaced steps, uh, they're also used for temporal, in, in temporal repeated measure analysis. So even if you have time, you can still use the spatial correlation structures uh, if you wish. The way that they are calculating the correlation though is a little bit different. So we're not gonna get too deep into the precision ag side of it, but so in precision agriculture, when we do Krigging, for example, if you've done Krigging, you're probably familiar with the concept of semi semi-variogram. And it's gonna use the semi-variogram to calculate the correlation instead of just doing a correlation, like looking into, into the previous steps as the, as the serial ones were doing. 
And I'll show you a plot here that I think is going to help you to understand what a semi variogram is and and to give more of that concept. So it calculates a semi variogram and then it uses the range of that semi-variogram semi as the actual correlation that goes into the model. And again, just let's just spin this for a second because I think the next slide is going to help us to illustrate these concepts. Let's see, maybe let me see. Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> there are many types of spatial correlation structures that we can use. The ones that I want to talk about and implement in the exercise are going to be the exponential, the Gaussian, linear, and rational quadratic. Again, these are some of the ones that are available through the package that we're going to be using, and that's why I'm introducing them to you. There are others out there. If you come across others, you know, just so you know, these are not the only ones. Oh, and this very cool as well. Sorry, I almost forgot about that. Okay, so I want to take a moment here on this slide because this is going to illustrate some of the concepts that I just talked about. So first off, what is a semi variogram Semi-variogram, so if you think about like, so let's think of a, like a precision ag approach perhaps, where maybe you have like, a, you did a grid and you took a whole bunch of soil samples that you know where they are, right? So you know the position of those, those soil samples. You know, I'm just gonna make a drawing here. I don't know if people online can really see this. Maybe I'm not gonna make a drawing. Well, let me, let me, let me use my, my chalkboard. That's gonna be so online people can see. All right, so imagine that you have a field that you go out and take soil samples at very specific places in this field, and you know the coordinates of those points, right? So a very common exercise to do, which if you're taking my precision at class, we're actually doing that right now, is to do interpolation, right? So imagine that I come here, I take these samples, soil samples, send to a lab, um, and I have like a soil potassium level in each one of them. So I know how much potassium there is in each one of those points, but I do not know what's in between them. And one of the interpolation methods we can do to learn to, to make a prediction of what would happen in space in between where it did not simple is called creeping. So what creeping does is it calculates a semi variogram, which again, I just want to show you on the slides. These are all different types of semi variograms. What is a sem semi variogram? So basically, it is taking the both the distance and the value between all observations that are one unit away. So let's say it would take compare these two, the both the distance and the and the actual value, compare these two, compare these two, or maybe not one unit away, but a, a, a fixed unit of distance away. So we take all those first and take the variance of all of those points. So imagine all points are connected to the next one. So that would be the semi variogram at the shortest distance. But now it comes back here and calculates the same correlation now between um, observations There are two units away. So now instead of doing these two, I'm gonna do this and this, this and this, this and this, and so on. And does that for all observations. And then it comes back, it does for three units away. So we would do maybe this and this, this and this. And then it comes back and does for four units of distance away. So maybe just these two are four units away. In a way that's calculating the correlation of all observations here that are at a given distance away from each other in any direction. And that's what's used to create a semi variogram So then here we have distance on the x-axis. And you can think of semi variogram as variance to some extent. So what we can see that for all of these different types of semi variogram models that are actually the, the names of the correlation structure that we're using, the correlation for all of them start very low and they increase until, or the semi variogram it starts very low, increases until a certain threshold, and then it kind of stabilizes after that. You can kind of see that for each one of these different models. Then what in our case, <clears throat> what is being estimated as the correlation is what is called the range of a semi variogram. 
the range of a semivariogram is the point, as the distance point on the x-axis where the curve plateaus out on the y-axis. So for all these, all of these four examples here, I believe that they were these plots were specifically uh, created with a correlation or a range value of one. So if you look on the x-axis here on the distance, whatever distance unit this is, whenever it reaches one is where the range, that's where the range is, meaning that that's, after that point, there is no more correlation between observations. So what does that mean if we just think about the interpretation of that? What that is telling us is that, let's say that this is our four yield data points and we have one, two, three harvests, like, to, you know, if we think that the, these would be like one, two, three days, it's not the case here, but just thinking about that, it would say that af after, after one day of difference, there is no correlation anymore. So anything that has, that is separated by more than one unit in distance in this case would not be correlated. But everything that is less than that and the range value is correlated and the less amount that the less distance there is between them, the more correlation there is. So this is what a semi-variogram is. We, as, we use them to, as, to estimate what is the range. And then that range is our correlation that goes into the matrix. I know this is a lot, and we're talking about a, a lot of different concepts, but I hope that you can get some understanding of how this is happening. And then when we are feeding this different spatial correlation structures to our models, what is happening is just that, I mean, our data points, our semi-variogram data points are fixed, but then it's gonna try to be fitting these different shape models to our data. And, we, and if any of them fit well our data, that is probably gonna be the one that's gonna have the best correlation structure for our specific data sets. And then we use that to determine our correlation, which goes into that matrix which then gives us proper errors for our comparison and so on. So it's, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So maybe let me take a quick moment and ask, you know, if anyone has any questions that I can help clarify, because I know this is a lot. So which one do we normally use, body and So we're gonna get to that towards the last slides here, but the quick answer is all of them. And, and we're gonna to get to that soon here. Before, before I get to that on the next slides, anyone has any thoughts or questions here before we move on? All right. So in R, we're gonna be using a package. Okay, so this is all the, th the theory about it. Now, how do we implement this in R? So we're gonna be using this package called NLME. I don't know if I asked you to install it yet. I don't think so. Um, but the package NLME has a few different functions that we can do this type of exercise of model fitting when it comes to repeated measures. One of the functions that that's the one that we're gonna be using is called LME from the NLME package. The reason why we're gonna be using this function is that if you think about it, our model is becoming more complicated, right? So we have a randomized complete block design with blocks treated as random, with a split plot, with repeated measure, right? So it's getting more complicated and LME is one of the functions that allows us to incorporate all of those features of our model into one function. The reason why we're not using LME4 package and LMER function is because that function does not allow us to specify different correlation structures. LME allows. So that's why we're changing them. And just again, as a reference, both LME4 and LME and, and, and LME are developed by the same people. So they, they, you know, it was by design, I guess, that they wanted to have two separate packages for these. So in R, this is how, these are the name of the functions. Well, I guess maybe these are the name of the uh, correlation structures that we just talked about. And these are the functions that are going to, we're going to use to um, implement them in R when we get to the exercise. 
All right, so just recapping here, what would be a repeating manager workflow? How do we go about this? How do we know which one of those structures are the best? So the first thing is we would run our default model assuming no correlation. So we don't even have to change anything about that. All the models we've been running are already assuming that that, that would be our default model. No correlation, assuming that those values are all zero on the off-diagonal of the errors. So we use that as our baseline. And now we start taking that model and then allowing it to vary and to use a different correlation structure option one at a time. So we take that model, that default model that we're not changing the correlation, we run it and then we copy and paste it. And now we allow it to change for the compound symmetry um, error structure or correlation structure. And then we run another one and allow it to change the general one and then the AR one and so on. So we're creating a whole bunch of different versions of the same or a very similar model where the only difference is that it's changing the correlation structure that we're allowing it to, to use. We always wanna make sure that we, we try different correlation structures that are um, compatible with that type of data. So for example, if you do not have equally spaced intervals in time, you're gonna be limited to which one of the time ones you can use. So you know we need to keep track of that. So once we have run all those models, we're going to compare them. So we're gonna see which one of these models are giving me the best fit to my data, which is gonna come back to that correlation. If I do have correlation in my model of, on the errors, most likely my default model is not gonna be the best fit. I'm gonna have one of these correlation models may be the best fit to my data because it was able to estimate the correlation that really existed there, that my default model was not even considering at all. So the way that we're going to compare them are going to be using the AK key information criteria and the basic information criteria. So these are called AIC and BIC. If you have not heard about these, these are basically metrics that consider how much of the noise of the model is being explained, but also relating that to how many parameters are being used. So if you just think about it, the more parameters we add to a model, the more we're gonna explain, even if those parameters are not good, even if they're not helping to explain a lot, but it may, at least a little bit, they probably would. However, that is not a very good model. It's not, a, it's not a very parsimonious model. We do want models that we have parameters that help us explain things, but we do not include parameters that are useless for us. They are just creating noise for us. So AIC and BIC are ways of looking at that. These values, AAC and BAC, are very specific to a model. So it's not like an R squared is gonna go from zero to one. It's gonna be a number, a crazy number. It could even be a negative number. It's very specific to your data. So it does not compare well on different data sets, but it compares well if we have the same data, but different models being applied to it. And that's what we're gonna be using. And in those cases, lower values of either AAC or BAC are better. So that is going to determine a better fit model. Once we do the comparison using AAC and BAC, then we're going to select the model with the lowest, let's say AAC, check the assumptions and use it for inference. So af after the point we select the model, it's the same workflow, but we have this step before we get to inference that is trying to find the best correlation structure for this model that is a repeated measure model that we're assuming uh, has correlated errors. Um, and I guess before I get to the summary here, I just want to make another parenthesis. On experimental design analysis, um, fixing lack of assumptions being fulfilled is perhaps the only place where you're going to play around with models and try things and see what's best. Other than that, we don't really do it, right? So I don't so, you know, I had some students that that uh, perhaps in the past were taught, like if you want, like in our example, even before talking about repeated measures, in our example, if we have the main effect interaction, if the interaction is not significant, can I remove the interaction from the model and rerun it? I guess it's a somewhat of a ideological, philosophical question. The school that I've, the school of thought that I've been through is we don't do that, right? You have your design, your design is coming from your treatment design, from mental design, what already happened in the field. You don't play around with that. Even if things are or are not significant, 
But the only place that we can play around with the model in, in experimental analysis is here. When it comes to fixing assumptions that are not being met, in this case here, we're gonna be playing with different correlation structures and testing to see which one is the best. All right, so very quickly on the summary here. So when we have time or space as part of the treatment structure, then residuals are not assumed to be independent. We will allow the error correlation structure to be estimated using different uh, algorithms, but then select the best one of them and then use that for inference as we've done in the past. So this wraps up our lecture. I know we're a little bit over time. Let me get your attendance. And after that point, I'll, I'll stick around if anyone has any questions. All right, please go ahead and claim your attendance. I will be following up with you with an email. Uh, in case you do want to read more on this, there is a whole chapter on the book that I share with you that you can read on your own. Heads up, it is more math uh, involved. If you are comfortable with that, great. If you're not, um, you know, you can skip some of the math and just focus on the on the text that is still very useful to understand what's going on. Um, and I also will follow up with perhaps a survey to ask if you have a data set for the midterm project and what type of data set you have. Um, and if you don't have, then I'll find a way to, to work with you so we get a data set that, that you can do. So uh, it, uh, it would also depend on what kind of data we have, like I have uh, CRD data so I can apply those four data. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, if anyone online has any questions, I'll be glad to to answer them. If not, then I'll disconnect here, but we'll, let me know. You can reach out by email if you have any questions as well. Right. Thanks, everyone.